In this video, we're going to talk about febrile seizure. To start, we'll walk through some of the epidemiological factors of uh, febrile seizure. Um, so in febrile seizure, we see this in about two to 5% of children. Uh, and more typically, we're seeing febrile seizure occurring within the uh, November to January months. Um, and that will be obvious uh, that we're seeing an increase in respiratory illnesses during those months, as well as June to August, um, where we actually see an increased incidence of GI-related illnesses. So about 2 to 5% of children, um, and often these children are going to be around the six month to five year range. So when you're looking at kind of averages, uh, most children are between six months and five years who are experiencing febrile seizures. In terms of febrile seizures, there are a couple of risk factors that we will talk about in order to outline kind of who is at the, the greatest risk of uh, febrile seizure. And one of the biggest risk factors that exist is a family history. So that would indicate likely some hereditary uh, connection to uh, febrile seizures. So if a patient's family has history of febrile seizure, they too are at higher risk of febrile seizure. The other risk is, again, we're most commonly seeing it in young children, and specifically children who are, are children who are less than 18 months old tend to be at higher risk. So when we pair a, a number of these things together, then um, they're typically going to increase the risk for potential febrile seizure. Another risk that we should include is if the patient attends daycare. One of the reasons for this would be the increased exposure to uh, GI and respiratory illness. So the children are simply at increased risk of developing infection, which will then lead to fever. And then finally, duration of fever is also a risk factor. And Often what we're seeing in terms of duration of fever is the shorter the fever for the patient, uh, the higher they risk, uh, they are at higher risk of recurrence. Uh, so what that means is if their fever spikes quickly, they tend to be at higher risk of febrile, uh, febrile seizure as well as recurrent febrile seizure. So when we see uh, rapid spikes in uh, in fever. So that's what the duration of fever kind of refers to is uh, are they at risk of developing a kind of fast and furious fever that leads to a potentially febrile seizure. So febrile seizure is related to the increase in temperature or is generally related to the increase in temperature and we see that through a number of mechanisms. So the first that we'll talk about is an increase in the kinetics of temperature sensitive ion channels. So one of the reasons why increasing temperature can lead to febrile seizure is we're going to see changes in the kinetics of those ion channels. So what that means is that ion channels that are temperature sensitive are going to see an increased uh, flow of electrons or throw, flow of ions through those channels. So as temperature rises, the kinetics of these temperature sensitive ion channels is going to change and as a result going to put the patient at a higher risk of seizure. It's going to uh, decrease the seizure threshold. And what that means or what decreasing the seizure threshold means is that the amount of neuronal activity required to cause a seizure becomes reduced. So essentially more neurons or we get more neuronal activity in the brain which is then going to make it so that um, we're close to having global activation or uh, widespread locational activation of uh, neurons. And it doesn't take much more stimulus to then lead to a seizure. And again, one of the reasons for this is that we can see uh, an alteration in the kinetics of temperature sensitive ion channels. So if this is our neuron, again, what can happen is we can see uh, changes in how quickly or the speed through which ions can move through their channels. So um, again, when we talk about kinetics, we talk about a change in speed or how quickly uh, through which ions can move through the channels. So again, a change in speed in which ions can move through their channels. There are a few other uh, risks or, or I guess mechanisms uh, that we can chat about when we look at febrile seizure. The other one is uh, the increase in interleukin 1b, which is a fever related pyrogen. So what happens, and this is an interesting one, is that as fever increases, 
we start to see an increased production of interleukin-1b, and interleukin-1b tends to increase uh, neuronal excitability through an increase in glutamate and GABA production. So as fever goes up or as temperature goes up, and we'll highlight that here, so we get an increase in temperature. One of the things that we start to see is the body is going to produce more interleukin-1 B, which is also a pyrogen. So increased temperature leads to an increase in interleukin 1B. And this is going to cause a couple of things. One is it's a positive feedback loop. Interleukin 1B is a pyrogen, so we will actually start to see an increase in temperature with the release of interleukin 1B. One of the other things that we get with a release of interleukin 1B is an increase in glutamate release. Uh, so we start to see uh, changes in our uh, glut glutamate and GABA release at their perspective uh, ion channels. You start to see increased glutamate and GABA. So we'll do glutamate in pink and uh, we'll do GABA in our blue here. So we get an increase in glutamate and increased in GABA. And what starts to happen is we start to see increased excitation of uh, excitatory neurotransmitters and uh, decreased inhibition of inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this glutamate and GABA, uh, although they have opposing effects, they work also on opposing neurons. So the increase in this glutamate and GABA is actually going to increase excitability. So an increase in glutamate, an increase in GABA, which is going to increase excitability. So our neurons, what we start to see is internally, they're increasing the production of glutamate, increasing the production uh, of GABA that uh, they have, and these ions can be released at their, their effectors. Um, so one of the other things that we see is as temperature goes up, or as we start to see an increase in temperature, we start to release interleukin 1b it has a couple of effects one is it's going to further increase temperature so uh, it's a pyrogen will increase temperature which means we get more interleukin 1b and the more interleukin 1b we have the more glutamate and gather that we're creating um, which can uh, inhibit or can lead to stimulation of neurons that leads to increased excitability so we get an increase in excitability because of that What's interesting about the release of this uh, glutamate and GABA is that it's prior, one of the areas that is most affected is the hippocampus. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here are these green areas here are the hippocampus. And the hippocampus A is a, a common player in epilepsy. So when we look at the hippocampus, it's deeply connected to other brain uh, tissues. So when we start to have an increase in neural activity in the hippocampus, it can send out large projections to the other areas of the brain, resulting in generalized seizure. And when we look at febrile, uh, febrile seizures, the majority of them are generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So one of the risk or one of the other risk factors that uh, plays a role uh, here is that we know we will have uh, an increase in interleukin 1b. So an increase in interleukin. 1b which, uh, which puts the patient at uh, further risk of febrile seizure can uh, lead to increasing glutamate and GABA in the hippocampus which can lead to seizure. The other piece especially in children is that fever is often associated with hyperventilation so uh, one of the connections here is that fever is connected to hyperventilation which can lead to alkalosis. So um, one of the the things that uh, we can see is as the patient's temperature goes up, they start to blow off much more CO2. So if we take a look at our buffer system here, what's going to happen as the patient uh, hyperventilates is they're going to blow off a lot of CO2. So we actually see the patient blowing off all the CO2 or the CO2 is gonna exit the body. And that's going to lead to a shift uh, to the left, or we start to see our kind of buffer system shifting to the left because we've lost CO2, or uh, we'll, essentially we have less pieces on this side of the equation than we have on this side, which will reduce pH. And the connection here is that uh, usually only around a 0.2 to 0.3 uh, increase in pH, so as we get rid of hydrogen ions, um, this can lead to uh, increased neuronal excitation. So. Um, as we shift it to the left, we put the patient at risk of a respiratory alkalosis. So as they hyperventilate, uh, 
And we know that with alkalosis, even a uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 increase in pH uh, leads to an increase in neuronal excitability. So at the end of the day, what we're really looking at are three items that are going to increase neuronal excitability. We change the kinetics of our temperature sensitive ion channels, which are going to allow for ions to move uh, more freely in and out of our neurons, which can lead to uh, excitation. We see uh, the release of interleukin 1b, which is a pyrogen that produces temperature. And as we have uh, more interleukin uh, 1b, that uh, increase in temperature actually promotes the release of interleukin 1b. So there's a cyclic connection between increasing temperature and production of interleukin 1b. The issue with that interleukin 1b is that it promotes the increase in glutamate and GABA uh, secretion, specifically in areas that are going to lead to increased brain excitation. Um, so perhaps we're releasing the GABA in an area um, which would normally inhibit the brain. So we inhibit an inhibitory neurotransmitter which or uh, neuron, which is going to lead to excitation. And we increase glutamate in areas uh, that are likely going to lead to an increased excitation, which will lead to more excitability. So again, we have increased brain excitation. The third is that fever leads to hyperventilation. And the risk with hyperventilation is the formation of respiratory alkalosis. As we have uh, 0 0.2 to 0.3 increases in pH, we also see increases in neuronal excitability. And at the end of the day, what we're seeing here is the more and more neurons that are becoming excited, the uh, easier it is to reach our seizure threshold. So as we have areas of the brain that are being constantly excited by these changes, it doesn't take much of a stimulus for this patient to end up uh, having a seizure. So big key piece of it is that these things together reduce the seizure threshold. So about, um, like we said, two to five percent of children will have febrile seizure. And we've outlined some risks. One of the other things that we should be aware of is the chance of recurrence of these febrile seizures. And about one third uh, of patients will have recurrent febrile seizures. So um, around one third of these patients uh, will have recurrence. And of these uh, one third of patients who have recurrence, about 10% will have more than three seizures. So over around 10% will have three or more uh, seizures. There are a couple of things that uh, increase our index of suspicion for um, for recurrence. So I'm just going to talk about uh, peak, the peak temperature here. So uh, one of the things that uh, is going to increase the chance of recurrence is our peak temp. Another thing that increases um, recurrence is going to recurrence is going to be the length of the temperature. So how long did the patient have a temperature for? And we kind of talked about this before, the fact that it is inversely proportional. So uh, on this axis here, we're going to have the percentage of recurrence. Uh, so how likely it is uh, for them to have uh, recurrent seizures. Um, and on this axis, we'll have uh, peak temp. And on this axis, we'll have the uh, length of seizure. Um, so what we typically see or what we're gonna see for these patients is that um, when they have a seizure, the peak temperature is inversely proportional to the uh, chance of recurrence. So if the patient has a seizure at a lower peak temperature, they're much more likely to have a seizure again. If you think about it, it makes sense because uh, for those patients, it doesn't take um, as high of a spike in temperature in order to initiate seizure. So lower, if I had a seizure, if my seizure was at a lower peak temperature, then I was at higher risk of recurrence. And we actually see the same thing with length of seizure. So for these patients, um, the shorter or for the length of uh, fever. So for if a patient had a seizure, for the shorter amount of time, or if they had a seizure, the fever for a shorter amount of time, um, then their risk of recurrence is going up. So shorter uh, fevers with lower peaks uh, typically um, will lead to more seizures when the patient has a seizure with that. So for example, a patient who has a peak temperature of say 39.5 after an hour who has a seizure, is at greater risk than the uh, patient who had a three-hour uh, fever 
and a peak temperature of 40 or 41. So when someone has a seizure, the length of time they had the fever prior to that seizure and the peak temperature at which they had that seizure at are important pieces of information because they're indicative of recurrence. So if I had a shorter fever with a lower peak temperature, but still had a seizure, then I'm at risk of having multiple seizures as a result. If you think about it, it makes sense. If it doesn't take as high or as long of a, of a fever to promote me having uh, a seizure uh, in the future. So that is kind of just a quick recap of febrile seizure and uh, some of the theories behind why patients have febrile seizures and some of the things we should look out to know if the uh, seizure will be recurrent or not. The last piece that we should probably talk about is there is a low uh, connected, um, there's a low level of connectedness between febrile seizure and epilepsy. So very little information to support that there is a correlation between patients who have uh, febrile seizure and then develop epilepsy. One of the only um, kind of minorly significant pieces is the more recurrent the seizures are, the higher risk that patient is of developing epilepsy, but there is specifically no correlation between if I have a febrile seizure, I will develop epilepsy. There's no evidence to suggest that.